Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 35 of Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to be reading Revelation 13 verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. In our last study, we discussed wisdom a little bit, and we saw that uh, by saying that here is wisdom, and let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, the Lord is indicating These things must be spiritually discerned through the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is laid out in the Bible as comparing Scripture with Scripture and making sure all conclusions harmonize with everything else in the Bible. And and so you have to look at the words that are used in, in a verse, compare the words with the same words if they're found uh, any other place and and just pray for wisdom and guidance and the Lord often grants wisdom and understanding and and here he's saying it is um, the number of the beast that is the number of a man now let's correct that before we move on in the the King James translators um, put the word a in there and when we see that word we uh, start to think of an individual it's the number of a man and people have speculated that oh it's Hitler or it's um, uh, uh, Stalin or or whenever a particularly wicked man has risen up in the world and this happens from time to time then people think this is the man of sin this is uh, the man that this verse in Revelation 13 is is uh, talking about but that's incorrect and the man of sin is Satan Um, the Bible has uh, verified that there's no question It's not a pope, it's not Hitler, it's not any other evil individual. It is Satan himself. And here, um, this word, uh, uh, should be eliminated. If if you have a pen, just exit out. It is not in the Greek text. Literally, this would read, for it is the number of man. Uh, it's the Greek word anthropo, and it's in the genitive case of man, that which pertains to or belongs to man. And, and here the number of the beast is the number of man. And, and God has in mind mankind in general, unsaved mankind in general, that um, that this number will represent. And his number is 603 score and 6. 666. This is the number of the beast. This is the number of man. Satan and unsaved man go, go together. Uh, they are his emissaries. They are within the kingdom of darkness. And, and, and so uh, it's, it's the number that uh, relates and identifies with them both. And this number, 666, um, is found elsewhere in the Bible, but not, well, it, it is in um, Chronicles or Kings, referring to the number of um, uh, items that, that, uh, of gold that Solomon took in 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 one year, um, 666 talents of gold. But 
for the most part, this number is not in numerical form or um, it's not written out that way, 666. It's written as two thirds or two parts in the Bible. If, uh, if we were to take um, two parts or two thirds and, and write it as a decimal, it would be 666 or 0.666. And, uh, and, and, and so when we, we see uh, two parts or two thirds in the Bible, it is basically uh, equivalent to 666. And we find that um, uh, a few times. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel 30. And I'll start reading in verse 8. And David inquired at Jehovah, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt, for thou shalt surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. Now, David is inquiring of the Lord because Ziklag has just been taken and burnt to the ground. And all the wives of David's men and their children have been captured by uh, the Amalekites, pirates. And now David, uh, who, who was about to be stoned by his own men, is inquiring of the Lord, what should he do? And the Lord tells him, pursue them, you will overtake them, and without fail, recover all, all the captives. Well, then in verse 9, so David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Now notice that there were six hundred men of, of David's soldiers, and four hundred continued on with David after uh, uh, the Amalekites to recover all the captives, their wives and their children. 200 men were, were so faint, they just couldn't go any further, and they stayed behind with the stuff. And now notice 400 as compared to 200. You have 400, two-thirds, 200, one-third. And, and uh, the two-thirds would identify with 666. Well, these men are David's men, and they went to battle with David. That that seems to be a very good thing that um, that uh, the 400 went to fight with David, David a type of Christ, and the 200, the one-third stayed back. Uh, and we, we can't say that was very valiant of them. Uh, so is there some sort of mistake? Because uh, as two-thirds represent the 666, the number of men, unsaved men, one-third in the Bible relates to the true believers. But here the division seems like it's a, a mistake. The, the 400, the two-thirds, are going to battle and the one-third are staying behind. Well, let's look on a little bit further in 1 Samuel 30. And it says in verse 21, And David came to the two hundred men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David, and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which Jehovah has given us, who has preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand, for who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, 
so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Well, notice that David, or the Bible actually, identifies the men that went with David to the battle as wicked men of Belial. And that is not said of the 200 men that stayed behind with the stuff. And, well, uh, why is that? Well, one possibility is that this battle um, had to do with the deliverance of captives. And David is a figure we know of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ, um, he, he, he delivered the captives um, of sin when he made payment for the sins of his people from the foundation of the world. And the Bible is very jealous and guards uh, that, that atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ very carefully. And uh, we read in Isaiah, Of the people there was none with me. Mine own arm brought salvation to me. Therefore, perhaps, this battle in which captives are delivered could be a picture of salvation and Christ alone gets the glory typified by David and those that seek to to uh, join battle in in the way that way in which only the Lord Jesus could have uh, that is they they want to put some forth some effort of their own well they they would represent the wicked on the other hand the 200, the one-third that stayed back with the stuff, they, they were trusting David. They were trusting David would recover the captives, their wives, their children, and, and so forth. And, and so they're, um, in a way, a better illustration uh, uh, in this historical parable of the true believers who do not go forth to the battle with the Lord Jesus Christ in which the captives are delivered, but but we are um, beneficiaries of that as David returns and shares the spoil with them. So that's more than likely how we can understand that. Now also, uh, in 2 Samuel, in one verse, in 2 Samuel 8, we see this, this division made again. And it says in 2 Samuel 8, verse 2, and he smote Moab, and this is referring to David, and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death, and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. Again, two-thirds, one-third. Two-third put to death. One-third is spared. They will live. They're kept alive. And uh, it, it is the biblical picture of God's elect typified by the one-third. And, and then there's the um, historical account that we're probably very familiar with in Second Kings in chapter 1. But I'll read it anyway in case there's someone listening that, that isn't that familiar with this. In 2 Kings 1, beginning in verse 9, Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And um, this is referring to uh, the, the prophet Elijah. And the king is dying, and, and he desperately wants to see Elijah, so he's sending his officer and, and soldiers to uh, forcibly bring Elijah to him. Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty. And he went up to him. And behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him in his fifty. Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, 
Thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And he sent again a captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burned up the two captains of the former fifties with their fifties. Therefore let, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel Jehovah said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. Well, uh, what, what do we see in this interesting historical account? We see that, um, that two captains in their 50s were burned up. One captain in his 50 were spared. They lived. And, and again, uh, it's a picture of the division of the human race. Two-thirds are under the wrath of God and they will be destroyed. One-third are spared by the grace and mercy of God. They are the ones God has predestinated to receive salvation. They will live. And, and uh, this also uh, is a very nice uh, illustration on how we need to approach God very humbly, not arrogantly, proudly, demanding of God as the cap, these former captains in their 50s come down, the king wants to see you. Uh, uh, no, notice the humble language of the third captain in his 50. He, he, he said, O oh, man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. No demands, no orders to Elijah, just... Um, just uh, uh, humility and supplication and that's how uh, God's people approach God very humbly and not arrogantly we don't go to God for instance as is common in in the church of our day and say I accept you I accept you Lord and now you're my savior and basically demand of God to save us because we did something no we don't do that we, we go humbly, let my life be precious in thy sight. And then there was waiting on the Lord until he would save. Well, let's go to one more place where this division is made between two-third, one-third. In Zechariah chapter 13, Zechariah 13, and I'll read verses 8 and 9. And shall come to pass that in all the land, saith Jehovah, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And he'll bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people. And they shall say, Jehovah is my God. Here God... Um, is is making it plainer for for understanding the one third they are my people I am their God and the other two thirds well they're cut off and, and they die and, but notice um, in verse eight where God says in all the land it shall come to pass that in all the land saith Jehovah two parts therein shall be cut off and die when will that come to pass. Where is that land? Well, the word land that's translated as land is a Hebrew word that can also be translated as earth. It shall come to pass that in all the earth, saith Jehovah, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And we have learned that in the day of judgment, and judgment day began, on May 21, 2011, a spiritual judgment has overtaken the world. And 
And on that day, God cut off two-thirds. It's not an actual number. It's a figure to um, uh, represent all the unsaved inhabitants of the earth, which are billions of people. But, but uh, in essence, God uh, cut off the two parts, the two-thirds, the 666, the number of men. But the third part shall be left therein. And, and this is a, a proof verse, uh, it's evidence, that it, is, it has always been God's plan to leave his people alive on the earth to live throughout the day of judgment, which is a prolonged period of time that perhaps there's a good likelihood it, it may continue for 1,600 days and God's people will be here the entire time. And, 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 and so... Uh, it's very interesting that uh, this word uh, left in verse 8, the third shall be left therein. That word is translated as remain uh, in some verses. For instance, in Proverbs 2, Proverbs chapter 2, and I'll read verses 21 and 22. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. That's the same word as left. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. And, and there's the same division we're reading about in Zechariah 13. The upright, God's elect, the perfect, made perfect through salvation. There, God doesn't see any more sin. And, and they will remain in the earth. It's interesting how it is the Lord's plan to cut off the wicked from the earth. And it's almost as though the people of God just remain here. And the Bible does say that um, the Lord's people will inherit the earth. And, of course, God doesn't mean the, the earth as it presently is. He will destroy it with a, with a fervent heat, along with the whole creation, and then recreate a new heaven and new earth. But in a sense, since the people of God remained on the earth throughout the day of judgment. Now let, let's um, just see how that works. Uh, uh, it, let, let's say we're correct. On October 7th, 2015, is, judgment, is the conclusion of Judgment Day and the end of all things for this creation. And, and God's people are here on the earth. Then Christ comes and uh, he destroys the world, and uh, it, it wouldn't take long, I'm sure, in a, in a moment, in, in a wink of an eye, he recreates a new earth, and there are his people. It's as though we never left, and we also are recreated. We have a new resurrected body, now joined with our new spirit, and, and so we're one whole personality, uh, 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 one whole new personality in both body and soul, and dwelling upon a new earth. And uh, it, as far as the timeline goes, if, if we want to say that, the timeline of this world, we go right up to the very end of the world where there is no, no more time. God destroys it, creates a new heaven, a new earth, and he places his people in, in that new creation, and we haven't inherited the earth. And, and so, as it says here, the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. Now, this uh, also reminds us of what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It says in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. 
And it is comforting as we read these things and we see how they fit uh, so well with uh, other scriptures, the things that God has opened up to us from his word. And and so we, we know that we're being tried as in a fire. Uh, as 1 Corinthians 3 says, every man's work is put to the fire and uh, to see whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. Well, the gold, silver, precious stones remains, is left therein. And and then God, uh, we're, we're alive and remain on the earth until that day. And then uh, the Lord will turn our attention to um, eternity future when, uh, when he finally destroys this world. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.